guys, welcome back to the Premier League Appetizer Show. I am Coach Indy. On today's episode, we're going to be reviewing game week 21, in which there were some dodgy results, some positive results, some VAR moments, some interesting manager head-to-heads, discussing all that kind of thing. Also looking ahead to game week 22, which is some mouth-watering fixtures, most notably Spurs versus Chelsea, which we'll dive into a little bit later on. We'll also be touching on some other news across, not just England, but also across the footballing world as well, which we'll dive into. Um, we'll be doing Indy versus the rest of the world, which we have got a, another guest, which we'll discuss later on. And we'll also be talking about the January transfer window. In fact, that's where we're going to be starting. So we'll just briefly touch on that at the moment. Um, in since the last time we spoke, there's only one sort of deal that's happened that's been confirmed, and that's Jesse Lingard has joined West Ham United on loan until the end of the season from Manchester United. Now, as, as a Man United fan, I think this is a good move, not just because he needs football, but I think for West Ham as well, I think he can offer something there as well. Also, from, from his personal point of view, I think he maybe thinks he's got a chance of possibly making the England squad for the Euros um, later in the summer as well. So I think all in all, um, and also on top of that, I think West Ham, if they're going to be pushing for Europe, that type of player that's sort of played in European games, played at European Championships, World Cups, that kind of thing, is going to add that much more experience. Um, if it does get to that final stage, you know, West Ham are pushing in the last 10 games for a European spot, his experience could become vital. Um, so like I said, that's the only transfer in at the moment. Transfers out, there's been loads that's happened um, most notably a lot of fringe players which I will discuss all of them because I like to sort of share my knowledge as well so most notable one Damari Gray he has left Leicester City and joined on a permanent deal um, for 2.75 million to a club in Germany I think it's by Leverkusen um, James Von Vokens should I say Jake Vokens should I say sorry he has joined Sunderland on loan to the end of the season, he was a, a youngster that was sort of back up to Bertrand at Southampton, so he's gone to Sunderland on loan to the end of the season. Um, Seri at Fulham, he has also gone on loan to Bordeaux to the end of the season. Catroni, who was uh, he was recalled back, uh, well, Wolves recalled him back, so I say sorry, on his loan when he was out of Fiorentina, recalled him back because they might needed him, or they did need him, sorry, during January. But now they've brought another body in, they can reload it back out. So he has gone to Valencia. Um, then a few United boys, so the young lad Palestri, who we signed in the summer, he's gone out on loan to Alaves. Tanif Chong, he has been recalled back from his loan at Rhoda Bremen, but he's gone to Club Bruges. And then Garner, the young lad at midfielder, who was on loan at Watford, he's now gone on loan to Notts Forest, where Chris Hewitt is in charge. So... Not too much happening in terms of big names, but there might be one or two that might happen. Um, there's, there's been a rumour going around tonight that a young lad, I to I've not heard of before. I say young lad, he's not young at all. He's 25, his name is Ben Davies. He's a left centre half who plays for Preston North End in the Championship. He's been rumoured to be joining Liverpool in the next sort of 24 hours or so. Um, I think a 2.7 million deal has been agreed. Incidentally, Celtic have been linked with signing him as well for the last couple of weeks. So I'm sure the lad who he'll cho- he'll choose to go to, to Liverpool over Celtic. Um, I don't believe he's Scottish, so maybe there's a connection there, I don't know. But I'm sure if Celtic come calling and Liverpool come calling, you go to Liverpool, don't you? Um, we'll move on to other news. There's just a couple of bits to talk about. Again, there's some, I suppose in some ways, if it does make other news, a lot of the time it is negative news because it is a news kind of thing. But... Um, just touching on what we spoke about last week about Martial and Twinsaby suffering um, racial abuse online through their social media platforms. There's been a bit more on the back of that as well. I'm sure you guys would have read, and some of you might not have, but Martial obviously at United, Twinsaby at United, but also now Marcus Rashford at United as well. He has also suffered some racial abuse as well um, after the game against Arsenal. He took to social media and basically outed a few people as well, which hopefully um, those people who have been racist to him on social media will obviously get some severe punishments, which we're, which I'm personally crying out for. I've been saying for, for years now that there should be a bigger punishment, and obviously with what's happened over the during this pandemic and 
Black Lives Movement, etc. has just come to fruition a bit more with, I think, everybody. It's not just people from BAME backgrounds, I think even people who are Caucasian and stuff like that um, would also agree that there needs to be harsher punishments for these people. Um, and also the other lad, Reese James from Chelsea, he's also um, suffered racial abuse. That was over the weekend as well, which is not great to hear. Um, a similar thing to happen to, similar to Marcus Rashford, where he's, things have happened on social media. Um, and he's taken that to social media and expressed his concerns. And obviously, both players have spoken to their respective clubs, Chelsea and United as well. Um, and then obviously, they'll take whatever action they need to take as well. So, um, sorry to bring that negative news, but it is negative news, but it is other news as well. So, one other thing I just want to talk about, which I just read up about earlier on today, was about Lionel Messi. So, I want to make sure I get this correct. Um, so, there's been some leaked documents. Um, from a Spanish newspaper called El Mundo. I'm not familiar with them, they're probably the equivalent to the, the sun over here. Um, apparently they've leaked some of Lionel Messi's contract details through their newspaper. Apparently they've got um, hold of a document that says whatever on his contract. Um, some of the stuff I've read is that he signed a contract um, a few years ago, whenever it was, a four year deal that he was gonna get paid 555 million euros throughout that four year period which is about 492 million pounds which is extortionate money but then again it is Lionel Messi. Granted football is in a completely different world to most other industries but in the footballing world it's, it's ridiculous money um, so yeah that's been leaked so apparently Barcelona might be taking legal action because they didn't leak the information to the newspaper I think I don't know how the Spanish newspaper have got hold of it um, but yeah, that sort of made some of the news. I thought, thought it was quite interesting to share as well. It's not all about talking about the Premier League, although people do want to know the, about the Premier League. Also interested to talk about other things in the footballing world as well. I'm going to move on to indie versus the rest of the world. Forgive me, my chair keeps sinking, so I'm just going to raise it back up. <laughs> Excuse my eye there if you saw it, nice and close up. Yeah, going to move on to indie versus rest of the world. Now, I did have someone prepared to get involved. However, he didn't quite get involved um, in time. So I had to draft someone in last minute. And this person has done very, very well. His name is Gerbs, he's my older brother. The second time he's taken part in indie versus the rest of the world. So I'm just going to dive into the results uh, immediately. Um, so my prediction for the Everton Newcastle game was Everton to win 3-1. Gerbs went for a 2-0 win to Everton, finished 2-0 to Newcastle, which was a decent result for Newcastle and did not expect that at all. So neither of us have picked up any points there. Palace versus Wolves, we both went for 1-1. Didn't expect many goals in this game at all. Finished 1-0 to Palace, so again zero points. Not a great start for either of us, but it does get better, guys, I can assure you. Moving on to Manchester City versus Sheffield United, we both went for 4-0 wins, finished 1-0, so we are both off the mark, um, obviously we were both expecting a hat full of goals considering City's form at the moment, but um, finished 1-0 to City, so we both picked up two points there. Um, if you're new guys to the channel, to the Premier League Appetizer Show, the scoring system is, um, if you get the exact score correctly, the scoreline correct, you pick up five points. If you get the result correct, like we just both did there, then you pick up two points. If you obviously don't get any of them, then you get zero points. So after three games each, we're both on two points. Uh, West Brom versus Fulham. Next game, I went for a... I thought Sam Allardyce would put on a bit of a clinic here and uh, not done the scoreline, but knowing that he needs to get a result against a fellow rival. So I went for a 1-0 win to West Brom. Gertz went, went out there and went 2-2. Loads of goals and it did finish 2-2. So he's picked up five points. He's moving on to 7, I'm on 2. Arsenal versus Man United. Um, I went for a Desmond, I went for a 2-2. He went for a 1-1. We both picked up 2 points there as it was a, it was a nil-nil. Um, moving on to Southampton versus Villa. I went for a 3-1 Villa win. He went for a 2-1 Villa win. It finished 1-0. So again, another 2 points apiece there. Chelsea versus Burnley, we both went for a 2-0 win to Chelsea, so we both picked up 5 points, pretty good from both of us there, Two shells, first win, 
for Chelsea since he's taken charge. Leicester versus Leeds, I went for a 3-1 Leicester win. Kelps went for a 3-2 Leicester win. And the scoreline was 3-1 to Leeds, so zero points there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, West Ham, Liverpool, I went for a 2-1, a nervy, edgy Liverpool win. Um, Kelps went for a 3-1 win, which was Bob on. So he's picked up five, I've picked up two. So he's absolutely flying at the moment. Um, and then... Brighton versus Spurs, I went for a Spurs 2-1 win, he went for Spurs to win 2-0. Brighton have just picked up a brilliant win, 1-0, so no, neither of us have picked up a point there. So, scores for this week are as follows. Indy has picked up 13 points, which is maybe a fraction above average this season. But Gerbs has picked up a massive 21 points, so I believe. That, you know, Let me just check. I think that might be the highest. It's 18 there. Yes, it is. It is. Um, just confirm there, guys. That's the highest um, score from an individual throughout the season, whether it be himself or a member who's representing the rest of the world. So, brilliant, brilliant participation there from Gerbs. Drafted last second. Maybe maybe that's the way forward for us as the world. I haven't got much time to think. Bang, could get the results in. So, Kimship scores for the season are as follows. Um, I've moved on from 132 to 145 after picking up 13 points, which I'm happy with. But the rest of the world have clawed the gap back um, quite a bit. So they were on 119 before that, now on 140. So rather than being a 13 point difference, there's now only a 5 point difference. So the lead has decreased the last few weeks actually. The week before that as well, it was a low scoring affair. But um, yeah, my uh, my scores, um, and my, sorry, my, my lead has decreased over the last few weeks. So we'll have someone else on after the next round of fixtures as well. So thank you very much girls for getting involved and especially because it was a very, very last minute. Um, we're now going to move on to some of the actual games for game week 21. So we'll just run through some of the games. We'll talk about some of the goals and key moments, all that kind of thing. So let's just go back to Everton versus <coughs> Newcastle. So he finished 2-0 to Newcastle. Wilson scored a brace. He probably could have scored four. You could argue around the goalkeeper hit the post and an opportunity, he had another sort of cutback situation which he dragged wide as well, so really, really surprising win for Newcastle, I think everyone would have lost a fo quite a few accumulators over the weekend because of this uh, game, although the saying is never bet on an early kickoff, isn't it? So maybe there wouldn't have been a, a few that sort of didn't bet on that. Um, so yeah, good win for Newcastle, just eases their pressure um, in terms of the lead position and also the pressure on Steve Bruce, because I felt like it was mounting quite a lot. He and Newcastle, I think, had lost like five, six, seven, eight games in a row. It was, it was a lot of games. Um, disappointing for Everton because obviously they're, they're pushing for them European spots and they've still got one or two games in hand as well and they're, they're right up there. So that would have pushed them even further, maybe into, I think ahead of Liverpool in the league before Liverpool played today. So a good win for Newcastle. Um, Crystal Palace versus Wolves. This finished 1 0 to Crystal Palace. Uh, low score and a fair, which we kind of expected both teams traditionally, although Palace have been less so a lot this, this season, traditionally both teams, and even, even Wolves actually less so this season, have normally both teams are quite defensive and trying to hit on the counter and, and nick a goal kind of thing. But both teams have played a little bit different this season. However, I did expect it to be a tight affair, which it proved to be. And the young lad Eze, who signed from Q, QPR from the Championship last season, he scored. Um, the goal, I haven't seen the goal, but by all accounts it sounds like it was a nice goal, a <coughs> well taken goal as well. And that eases the pressure off Palace a little bit as well because they were creeping down the table. Moving on to Manchester City versus Sheffield United, so most most people would have put, if they were putting a bet on over two and a half, over three and a half goals for in this game, Manchester City to put on a bit of a clinic and dispatch Sheffield United first versus 20th. Having said that, obviously Sheffield beat United the, the game before and they might have been well, their confidence would have been high. And having said that as well, actually, they beat Newcastle a few games before that as well. So I think they picked up six points from nine, I think, possible nine. So maybe the confidence, maybe we're doing them a bit of a disservice there. Having said that, on the flip side, City had won like 11 out of 11 before that, conceding like two goals. So I think most people overall would have said four, five, six goals potentially. Potentially. I don't know if Man City put in a clinic, but realistically, um, Sheffield haven't really been dispatched too often this season. So maybe... Somewhere in between, maybe a 2 or 3 nil would have been about right in the predictions. Uh, Jesus with the goal, by the way, incidentally. So, 
um, if anyone went for Sterling for their captain in the fantasies or Gundogan or Foden or anyone like that very very unlucky you could argue but um, yeah one nil. we'll move on to the next game which was the Desmond which was West Brom versus Fulham arguably the most important fixture of game week 21 because obviously both teams are in the relegation zone um, it's two disappointing results in a row for Fulham because okay they've played away from home against both their rivals or a couple of their rival rivals back to back but they haven't picked up any points um, sorry any, any W's should I say picked up two points 0-0 against Brighton 2-2 um, against West Brom and they haven't they haven't really the results haven't really helped them if I, I think obvious saying this is but I think you ask Scott Parker now or go, after in hindsight you know would you rather win one or lose one I think he would say yeah because for obvious reasons you're picking up three points I get that it's obvious but it's also just helps with momentum and confidence because you picked up a W as opposed to it's another two games without a win kind of thing and they do like a draw I think they must have drawn about ten games this season um so I think Fulham had taken the lead, West Brom had turned it around and then Fulham uh, clawed their way back into the game, so 2-2. Again, I can't, can't comment too, too much about it, although I know Mitrovic started and he got an assist and Pereira continues to do good things for, for West Brom, whether it be goals or assists. I think he picked up another assist in this game. Um, yeah, and then moving on to the 5 game, which was Arsenal versus Man United, a big heavyweight clash if you like. And certainly <laughs> 10, 15, 20 years ago it definitely would have been in a way. Uh, on paper, should we say. Uh, this finished nil-nil. Um, United probably had the, the better of the chances, but I wouldn't say they deserved to pick up three points. Um, obviously, if, if you picked up the W, we're not, not moaning about it. But I think you've got to be fair and honest. I don't think we deserve necessarily to, to win the game because Arsenal had their moments as well. Lacazette hit the crossbar free kick. Smith Rowe had a chance. William had a chance. Pepe had a chance. I think William's chance was blocked from a defender I think it was Wan-Bissaka and Pepe's chance was really good blocked by Harry Maguire which he did really well to spread himself to make himself a bigger target um, so again it's one of them where Arsenal will probably be a little bit happy with the fact that they've kept their sort of run going in terms of being unbeaten for a long period of time and then Man United have been probably disappointed because they obviously they lost to Sheffield United before it's weird how a result before can, a, can sort of give you a different outlook after the next game if that makes sense so if United had won the game against Sheffield United, I would have been saying that's a decent point. I'm happy with that. It's not too bad. Happy days kind of thing. But obviously, because you've lost the game before, the the point doesn't seem as good. So, a bit of a strange one from a psychological point of view. Uh, moving on to Southampton versus Villa, which was the last game on the Saturday. Finished 1-0 to Villa. Ross Barkley scored actually a really good header. Um, he's not known for his heading, but Jack Reedish put a lovely ball in, sort of on the half volley, curled in. And all he had to do is sort of mid in his stride. It reminded me a little bit of... A, of Bruno Fernandes header against Everton in the sense that he arrived into the box and all he had to do was sort of direct it, he didn't have to put much into it, although he did sort of put his nick muscles into it, sort of made it a bit more firmer when it went to the goal, the car the goalkeeper was rooted. Um, big moment in this game with VAR getting involved, Danny Ings thought he'd equalise in the 90 odd minute, it's in stoppage time, but he was given offside because of the shirt sleeve, um, which <sighs> It is what it is, guys. I don't think anyone can sort of argue with it now. It is what it is. People should be used to it. All that's frustrating when your your team's on the receiving end of it. Um, so yeah. So basically, what happened was Danny Ings was probably in this position here. His sleeve was, but the line was sort of drawn. It was kind of like in this area here. So his sleeve is part of the area where he can score from, or whatever it is. I don't even know exactly what the law is, guys. The keys chopping and changing. Last year it was armpit. Now it's sleeve. They're wearing black armbands every day, so that could play a part into it as well. I don't know. Um, but it, it, it was just frustrating for, for Ralph Hoosen, Hassan Hootel and his team to not to pick up anything. Having said that, I do think Villa deserved the win. Um, I felt like they had more cutting edge. They didn't have loads of chances, but I felt like they looked the more, more threatening of the two teams. Um, and also, from Villa's point of view, helps them um, push again. They're another team like Everton that pushing for them European spots. They've got a couple of games in hand as well. I think they're about 7th in the league. Win both of them games, they're into the top four. So they're in amongst it um, at the moment. Um, okay, Moving on to Chelsea versus Burnley. The early game, I didn't see any of this game. Um, however, obviously, Thomas Tuchel, I touched on it earlier, picked up his first W. I saw he made quite a few changes. Um, uh, Chilwell was taken out. Alonso came in at left wing back. Uh, Mason Mount come in for Ziyech. Werner come in for 
Havertz, Abraham coming in for Giroud. So there was a number of changes. Um, yeah, so interesting to sort of watch Chelsea over the coming weeks to see what they do in terms of formation. Because the other thing is they kept the formation the same again as well. So um, from what I've sort of briefly sort of read, playing three at the back as well. So um, I think good win for Chelsea to get off the mark. Good win. No panic stations for Burnley. They've they've been on, they've had a couple of good re results beating uh, Liverpool at Anfield, breaking that that record. Um, Liverpool's home record. Um, and then obviously the turnaround against Villa as well, um, which would have been very, very pleasing for Sean Dyche. So no panic stations there. Um, I think just one one thing I, I know, Alonso, he is very, very good at playing left wing back. You could argue probably the best in the league. <clears throat> so it'll be interesting to see what happens there because he's got more of a cutting edge than what Ben Chilwell has um, in terms of attacking threat in that formation so it could be one to watch I wouldn't be surprised potentially this might work I'm just sort of reading between the lines very very early at the moment they're playing Rudiger left centre half Thiago Silva in the middle and Aspilicueta right centre half I wouldn't be surprised if Rudiger plays right centre half and then Ben Chua plays sometimes as left centre half just to give them a bit more pace as a sort of back three um, and also just to protect um, Thiago Silva because obviously you know He's an, old, he's an elder statesman now, but I haven't said that he does read the game quite well. But yeah, this is a thought of, after a couple of games, that could be a position that he plays in um, equally. He might change to a back four and it, it might, Jill might come back in and it'll be all rosy for him again. Okay, moving on to the Leicester-Leeds game. I only saw the 20 minutes of this back end, maybe half an hour of the, <coughs> the second half. Um, no, I saw, I saw all the second half actually because... At half time, I saw the analysis, and Jamie uh, Redknapp and Graham Sooners were all saying that <coughs> Leeds had the benefit, or so the, the better of the chances in the first half, and probably deserved to be up. And obviously, they, that forced actually Leicester to make uh, a tactical change. They actually took off a winger and brought in the centre half. And immediately, you would think, hang on a minute, that's a very defensive change, but actually, it made them more offensive because it gave them an extra body. It made both fullbacks were going forward as opposed to just one. And obviously three centre backs are sort of protecting that space, which was quite interesting. I'm really pleased for Ricardo Pereira. He's been playing the last few games as well. For me, he's the best right back in the league. Um, let me know in the comments, guys. Do you agree with me? Do you think there's a better right back in the Premier League, whether it be Carl Walker, Wan Bissaka, Trent, whoever it may be, guys? Let me know in the comments. I I personally think it's Ricardo Pereira. Obviously not at this precise moment because he's just come back from injury, but pre his injury last season, for me, he'd be the number one right back of a sign at United. Anyway, um, I'm getting sidetracked here. So, yeah, Leeds end up winning the game 3-1. Bamford's going to go and get two assists. Brilliant, like, unselfishness as well. Like, I really applaud his uh, unselfishness on the third goal because so many players, not just strikers, but just players in general, would shoot in that instance. I don't know if everyone's seen this, but basically he's threw one-on-one -on -one with the keeper and you can see Jack Harrison just like, as sort of as he's tra travelling towards goal, you can see Jack Harrison in the corner of his eye, just like open on the right side, like no one's tracking him at all. He's like, I could just slot this myself. No, not so square and, and Harrison's pretty much got an open goal. I, I, I love that because it was 2-1 at the time. He could have quite easily shot himself, could have, could have saved it, put it wide, whatever. And if I think five minutes to go, Leicester could have got the other end and scored and it 2-2 and he probably gets a rollick in for Bielsa and his teammates as well saying why are you not that square but you don't see him very often so I'm just pleased to he's, that's an ultimate team player for me and he and I think he he expressed that in his post-match as well like put it on the plate from a teammate and get the three, three points and we, we uh, travel back up north to Yorkshire kind of thing so um, moving on to West Ham versus Liverpool Mo Salah returns back to form um he scored a couple of game goals last week in the, in the FA Cup, but he hadn't scored in the league for quite a while. It was like six game weeks, so it would be like about a month or something like that. Scored a couple of goals. Second goal was fantastic. First goal was typical Salah, inside right position. Tries to create that little avenue where he can just sort of shift it and hit with his left foot for that set outside the post and in and the keeper no chance. That's a typical Salah goal. But the second goal, tremendous. Trent for Diag to Shakiri. This, this is from a Newcastle, uh, sorry, Newcastle, West Ham corner um, Trent they, they break out Trent hits a dive to Shakiri. Uh, he hits a lofted ball over the defender 
Mason Hayes kills it pretty much with his right foot on the stretch um, and then just flicks with his left foot outside his left foot past Fabianski. It's a really, really class goal. Um, yeah, and then obviously Liverpool seem to be back to their, their best, if you like, from the last couple of, not just the results, I think the performances, if you look deeper than that, they have looked a lot better, um, a lot more cohesion in their team. Incidentally, they didn't have Mane in the team today, either, or for me, they didn't start either, so two of the, 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 the so-called you know usual front three that would normally play didn't sort of play um, the whole part, whole part of the game, which <clears throat> in some ways... Is a good thing because it shows that the, the depth in the squad and the unity of the squad, but also um, it shows that we've got more to come as well. You know, if Mane comes back and, and Firmino, who, to be fair to him, showed a bit of class that third goal, knocking it square to. <coughs> he did a 1 2 with Chamberlain and knocked it square to Genie. Um, so yeah, that was a class moment. And then a late consolation for, for Dawson, who's proven to be a bit of a goal scorer for, um, for West Ham. But no panic stations for West Ham, they're in amongst it as well, sort of fighting for the European positions. Um, they'll go again midweek. Uh, moving on to the last game, which was Brighton versus Spurs. Finished one 0 to Brighton. Um, who scored the goal? I think it was Trossard. Scored. Yeah, it was Trossard who scored the goal. Um, had it in the background because I wasn't really watching it too much. Uh, Spurs, from what I was hearing in the commentary in the background, didn't play particularly well. And the bits I did see did, didn't play particularly well. Now I don't know if that's just purely coincidental because Kane wasn't there or. If you look deeper than that, and you've got their last batch of games, eight to ten games, they haven't actually picked up that many Ws. So maybe it's an uh, underlining problem, not a cane problem. I'll probably suggest it is probably an underlining problem. And maybe the first part of the season they've they peaked a bit too soon, and now with all the games and stuff, the the depth of the squad um, isn't as as good as we think. You, you can bear in mind as well, like when Spurs at the beginning of the season they're playing brilliantly and picking up a lot of Ws and on top of the league, they're they're playing two games a week, but they were just rotating their team pretty much. It was seven, eight changes every three, four days. So like Kane, Son, um, Hoiberg, Sissoko, the key players weren't, weren't playing in the Europa League um, in, the, in the qualies. They're rotating around, and they, they might have played one or two, but not loads and loads of games. It was, you can manage the minutes a lot more. Now that's been put to one side. It's now just league, league, league every three, four days. He's having to play them players all the time, and, and they're not getting the rest like they were getting. Uh, the early part of the season so that's what I'll put it down to um, and I think uh, Reno had alluded to that uh, going into this batch of fixtures sort of mid, beginning of December he said this next period of time is going to be a more challenging period for the, for Spurs compared to the period they've just come out of and obviously he's a manager he knows exactly what he's been, been there done that he knows exactly how the squad not just the Spurs squad but every squad he's had in the Premier League other leagues he knows the, the demands if you like physically um, so yeah, that's a back-to-back -back defeats for Spurs. That's first win at home for Brighton this season and also I think the first win uh, in over a year. And actually I think the last time they won the home game was this fixture last season when they beat them 3-0. Um, I think Lloris picked up a, um, a bad injury that day as well. So yeah, that concludes sort of game week 21 results, guys. Some obvious results you expect, some... Shock ones with this, the Leeds one beating Leicester, you could argue, um, and definitely the Newcastle versus Everton game. I'm going to move on to game week 22 fixtures. We'll just run through some of them. It all starts off on Tuesday, a couple of days' time. We've got Chef U versus West Brom, another, another six pointer, guys. Um, I said it a few weeks ago when I think a couple of other teams played a big game. I think it might be Fulham Brighton. Whoever wins that game is going to just give them so much more confidence for the rest of the season. And it could have bring one of them back in, they could stretch the other team could stretch away and that'd be the, the end of it. I mean my personal view is that the three at the moment I th I thought this for about four to six weeks now, then three ain't getting dislodged, they're staying exactly where they are. Just rather despite sorry, Fulham having a game in hand, I don't think that's they're not gonna get out of it. They haven't got enough um quality in both the boxes to to get out of it in my opinion. Um so yeah so Sheffield United West Brom this is a massive six pointer who we can win this? If if Sheffield win, if Sheffield United sorry win this, forgive me, Sheffield United fans. If Sheffield United win this, that'd be three wins and I think four or five games, and that's going to give them huge confidence. They have to go on a massive run anyway to to get themselves out of the you know the relegation zone. But then on the, on the flip side, if West Brom win it, that kills Sheffield United altogether. I think there's, there's, they'll probably finish bottom of the league. They won't even get even to nineteenth, and it'll give some belief and confidence for Sam Allardyce and 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 his team. 
Yeah, moving on to Wolves versus Arsenal. You remember the reverse of this fixture was the terrible moment when Raul Jimenez um, fractured his skull, and obviously there was, you know, thank God he's he's you know he's back and he's had surgery. He's he's back and amongst. Um, he's obviously I don't think he's training or anything that like that yet, but he's he's getting on the mend. He's around his family. He's he's bet he's getting better. He's on the mend. Um, in regards to the game itself, it's probably quite a big game for for Nuno. He's they they're crawling down the table um, at a rapid rate, and it's they need to pick up a W quickly. Obviously, they picked up a point against Chelsea a couple of game weeks ago, and then the defeat against Palace ain't great. They lose this one again as well, and then teams in around them pick up more points. They're going to be in around the bottom six, and you wouldn't have thought that with Wolves. They're normally fighting in amongst the top six, top eight. On the flip, Arsenal, Arteta is obviously not just Arteta, but especially the younger players who have come in the team, the likes of Smith Rowe and Saka, um, Tin, who's relatively new to the team, Holden, who's done outstanding for me the last, even before when they were going through their balance spell, I think he was playing really well. Not outstanding during that period, but especially this, this last block of games where they picked up some Ws. He's been the standout defender for me in terms of def defending. Obviously, Tierney's done really well in an offensive position, but in terms of defending, he, he's a, he looks like he enjoys defending. So if they can pick up a W, that's going to put pressure on the likes of Villa, Everton, Chelsea, West Ham. Because they're, they're literally that close to them now. Um, so that'll be an interesting game. And then they've got a couple more games on the Tuesday. You've got Man United of Hampton, a big game for Man United. Can they get back to winning ways after a couple of dodgy results, you could argue? Um, versus the Hampton team, it's quite depleted at the moment. Having said that, they did put in a good performance against Villa. They're missing Vestergaard, they're missing... Uh, Carl Walker Peters, um, who else are they missing? They're missing one or two others as well. Um, so hopefully they'll get some, um, maybe one or two, well, maybe not for this game, but maybe the game after. It's always been quite a hard game. I remember Project Restart, we played them during our really good run and we drew 2 2 in this game, and I thought that might cost Man United a top four position in the league. Obviously, we did enough after that, but they're always in your face kind of team, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how United sort of. Approach that high press, energetic approach from 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 Palace. Do they uh, from Southampton? Sorry, do they go right? We'll go with Cavani to get a physical presence to get out of the pitch, or do they go Martial and try and have a bit more pace? Um, yeah, it'd be interesting. Cavani started last game, maybe Martial this game. That probably make more sense given that they lose like to play high. Uh, moving on to Newcastle versus Palace now. Both these teams are in and around. They're not obviously in the relegation zone, but they're around the sort of 15, 16, 17 mark. One of them can pick up another W, so it'll be back to back wins for them. Obviously, it puts excuse me, a bit more pressure on the team that loses, but also can elevate them and sort of they can be looking up as opposed to down. So, won't talk about that too much. Moving on to Wednesday, Burnley versus Man City. Now, touched on Burnley, obviously, they lost to Chelsea today, but they've had some decent results. And if you look at their last sort of batch of games, the last 10 games, when they've had pretty much their whole squad fit and they're almost start eleven fit every game. They picked up a healthy amount of points. Now, I'm not saying they're going to beat Man City in this game, but it'll be a harder game than, you know, put it this way, Man City beat Sheffield United 1-0 last game and no, I don't think many teams would have predicted that. I wouldn't be surprised if Man City win this game 1-0 this time around. So it's normally a difficult type of game at Turf Moor, less so at the Etihad. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be a tight, tight affair on that one. Um, obviously if Burnley can do us a favour happy days Fulham versus Leicester and I'm the reverse of this fixture actually Fulham beat Leicester at um, at Leicester sorry why is it black there yeah so I think it was 2-0 maybe I think uh, there's a goal from Lukman on the counter and um, I think maybe Reed has scored as well so this could potentially be a nice game for Fulham uh, I'm not sure I think Leicester will be looking for a response but the Rodgers will be getting to the team a bit more and look for that response, especially if they again be fighting for them Champions League or European spots, whatever they're looking for. Um, but the likes of Madison and Barnes, Tiedemans, whether Pereira starts again, I don't know. I don't know, maybe, maybe too much for him. Because um, obviously, Ken one for Castani, who picked up over a bit of a hamstring injury. James Justin looks every bit like a Premier League player now after you know them signing them from, from Luton, or Leicester signing them from Luton, should I say. So there's lots of quality there. Um, Yes, yeah, so that'd be a good game. Leeds versus Everton, I think this would be another good game as well. Um, Leeds obviously just going to play that murder ball. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, murder ball, but that's sort of what's known for 
how Leeds play, they literally just run, they do man to man game for like 10 minutes in training where you have to run with your man. So if I'm marking whoever it may be, Bobby, Bobby Reed, whoever it may be, I've got to run with him for 10 minutes in a, in a game which they do in training so that's what's called murder ball so you're literally just running constantly back and forth so if the ball gets flipped and the opposition's got the ball then you've got to chase your opponent for again that period of time so hence why it's called murder ball but they're brilliant at it they've got so much energy obviously Everton a disappointing result against Newcastle so they're going to be looking for a response I'm sure Ancelotti will get into them as well um, and they're looking stronger with, uh, it was a bit lip I think that game against against Newcastle but they've gotten a lot of their uh, key personnel back with Hames and, and DCL and, and Luca Dean, Coleman, etc. I think it's be a good game. Actually, be quite an interesting game to see, to see um, two experienced managers as well. Actually, two two heavyweight managers, if you like, as well. I mean, obviously Ancelotti's won a lot more, but Bielsa's got a lot of pedigree and a lot of respect amongst uh, the the managerial and coaching world, if you like. Um, Villa versus West Ham. Uh, this would be a good game, actually. I think again, both teams in quite good form. Both teams scoring goals. Um, both teams uh, got quality in everywhere on the pitch. You look at Cresswell's delivery. You look at the likes of Bowen and Ben Rama linking with Antonio, who's a goal threat. You've got uh, Rice and Suchek really stable in that central midfield area. And then on Villa, obviously, you've got the match winner, Jack Grealish. I really like Holly Watkins. Um, guys, I'm going to say... <coughs> Actually, no, I'm not going to say this. I'm going to leave it for another episode. Um, so you guys will have to continue watching to find out what I'm going to say about Ollie Watkins. Anyway, let's move on. Um, obviously, he's a, he's a goal scorer. You've got McGinn and Douglas DeWares who do really well in there. They're quite industrial. They provide a lot of energy and stability for that team. And then you've got Mings and, and Konzo who provide a good sort of stable partnership alongside. Obviously, Martinez behind behind them as well. So it'd be quite a good game. I can't see it being a nil nil. I, I definitely think, I, I think I can definitely see some goals in that. Um, and then Liverpool versus Brighton which is the last game on the Wednesday. Obviously, Liverpool picked up back-to-back -back dubs, um, so they'll be flying into this game. Obviously, I know Brian aren't, no mugs, obviously, we just beat Spurs, so it's a good result for them. And they've had, I think, three clean sheets in the last four or five games Brian have, so I can't see it being a massive scoreline for Liverpool. Having said that, they are look like and they've turned a corner and they're, they're attacking players and attacking threat does look like it's there more. I, think, I felt like the last, take away the last two games, I felt like that cutting edge... Um, and clinicalness has been lacking for Liverpool. It's not not been so much the defensive issues, despite them missing lots of players around that area. It sounds strange, I know, but I feel like it's been the attacking part that's let them down. Um, so yeah, again, that'll be another interesting game. Obviously, if Brighton can do Man United a favour, that'll be sweet. Of Graham Potter, be sweet. Um, and we'll move on to the big game, which is Spurs versus Chelsea, a London derby on the Thursday. Spurs obviously will be looking for a massive response uh, after a back-to-back -back dub, so they don't want to be losing three games. I don't think, I'm trying to think, I don't actually know. If any, leave a comment, guys. Has Mourinho ever lost three games in a row? In, not just in the Premier League, but when he was at Real Madrid, when he was at Porto, when he was at... Um, Inter Milan has he ever lost three games in a row let me know in the comments because I don't actually know that so if th th this could be a first um, I'm sure if it is going to be the case they'll probably mention it on Sky or BT whoever it's on I think it's BT actually they'll probably bring up the statistic if if Spurs were to lose this game that would be Mourinho's only time they've lost three games in a row if that is the case guys so yeah let me know in the comments if that is true do some, uh, some recon for me guys I'm, I'm interested to know um, and obviously two cows just picked up his first one at Chelsea um, this will put obviously the with Frank Lampard getting sacked the fans obviously aren't going to be too happy with it because he is obviously a club legend but so early into Tuchel's reign if he can pick up a W against a big rival not just in the league but also geographically um, in a derby that's going to go a long way to sort of the fans being on your side and Tuchel's side so um yeah, that, from that side of things, I think he that probably give him extra motivation as well. Um, I do think Tuchel is quite uh, charismatic and quite he's quite engaging as well. I watched his whole press conference, twenty five minutes the other day. I'm a bit of a geek like that, and he's very engaging. Like he's he knows what he's talking about. He's very charismatic. Like I said, he's got lots of enthusiasm and energy as well. And I've seen some clips on the training ground as well, which again, sort of thing I do. I love to sort of watch that and sort of study and analyze. 
um, people's approaches on training fields and press conferences and media and all that kind of thing on the touch on a match day. Um, that's another thing I like doing as well, guys. Obviously, at the moment, when you're watching the game, you've got the option to have it mute. I prefer to have it on mute because I love hearing all the players talk, the, the detail, the, the managers, the information they're passing on. Um, so yeah, that, all that kind of thing, that's what I love to love to do. Guys, we're going to round it off just there. Um, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel already, please do so. We're looking to hit 10k subscribers in 2021, so it's a big ask. But if you can, if you can subscribe to the channel and then just ask a friend to subscribe to the channel, um, and then maybe ask another friend to sort of channel, that would be brilliant because there's going to be regular content from the Premier League appetizer shows or tactics and analysis boards. Podcasts will be happening a bit further down the line, but they will be happening in the pipeline, guys. And obviously I've got some coaching content as well, which I've been uh, working hard on in the background as well, which will be coming your way as well. So, yeah, hit the subscribe button, leave a like, leave some comments as well. Plenty of opportunities for you guys to comment throughout the video I love to see people's uh, feedback as well uh, and we'll see everyone on the next video.